How's everybody doing today? How was the exam? Yay, nay. People seem to finish it fairly quickly. Was that just my perception, or was it, a, it seems shorter? Shorter? Shorter good, shorter bad? Good or bad? Any thoughts about the exam? First one is more conceptual, yeah. And what you'll find is the further we get going along, the more memory sort of things start popping up because um, we're starting to get into things that'll be just sort of facts that we're going to go through and do. That's going to have a lot to do with metabolism and things like that. And those are pretty much just facts. You know? Nobody has any comments? You don't have to like it. I want, my, my feelings are capable of handling it. I'll just take your name down and make sure I flunk you in the class, but, you know, it's a joke. <laughs> Nobody? What was the extra credit? You like the extra credit? Yeah. Oh, there you go. A sure way to get on everybody's good side is put extra credit on the exam. Everybody's smiling, okay. Everybody get it? I made it easy enough? I should make you recite some lyrics to a song or something. That'd be. Are Friday or Monday? Huh? So um, the I spoke to the TAs, and the plan is to have it by Friday. That's just the plan. I can't promise anything, uh, but once it's done, I will put a message out uh, on email to everybody. Let them know, and you'll pick it up over in the main office again. Please don't bother them in the main office uh, about. In fact, the main office is that. That reminds me. The main office is changing. They're only going to have certain hours in which they give the exam out, so I'll have to make sure we've got those hours. Otherwise, it could well be Monday, in which case I might bring it to class if that happens. So, i start throwing them out. Okay. Um, well, I do appreciate feedback on exams. Um, I, on the first exam, I got all the way past and realized I hadn't asked for any feedback, and um, I think it's useful for me to hear your feedback, whether you like it or you don't like it. Um, and I know it kind of puts you in a bad position. Well, I got to tell the professor, blah, 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 this, you know. Uh, but um, I think it's, it, it, one of the things that it, it's important to do is you want exams to be fair, and you want exams to um, reflect student knowledge, you know. And so I will be the first to tell you, I was talking to a student in my office earlier today, that I'll be the first to tell you there, there are no perfect exams. And I would love to give a perfect exam, but I, I don't believe that there are perfect exams. And I think it doesn't mean you shouldn't be trying to make them perfect. Um, and you shouldn't be trying to improve those exams, but um, I don't think that any exam is perfect. And I've written exams for many years, and I can tell you I've learned a lot about writing exams over those years. But even today, I, I find when I write certain questions, it's like, well, and I look at it afterwards, I go, why did I word it that way, you know? Um, so that does happen to some extent. Okay, well, with that introduction, are we ready to dive into the next material? Okay, so today I'm going to talk about um, some uh, techniques. So we talked about techniques about isolating proteins. Today I'm going to talk about techniques relating to uh, an area that we hear a lot about, biotechnology. Okay? So biotechnology is really uh, applying our knowledge of something to make or do something. So we're trying to use techniques of uh, biology and molecular biology to accomplish something. That's really what we're trying to do. And some of these, I imagine some of you have you've already done in some cases, um, and that's fine. I'm going to go through them, and so everybody's on the same page. All right. Well, uh, we talked previously about agarose gels, and I'm just going to remind you that agarose gels are ways of separating uh, DNA fragments, and we use polyacrylamide gels for separating protein fragments, and the basis of both of these is that we have negatively charged molecules that are being pushed through uh, a support, in this case, agarose. And the speed with which they move through these different supports is a function of their size. So the larger fragments will go the slowest, the smallest fragments will go the fastest. 
Now, if you've ever worked with DNA, you've almost certainly run a gel. Um, gels are ubiquitous, and they allow us to analyze DNA fragments quite readily. Okay. Well, um, how do we get DNA fragments? One of the ways in which we get DNA fragments um, is by cutting them with enzymes that cut DNA at specific places. These enzymes are called restriction enzymes. You can also hear them called restriction endonucleases. That's a bigger name. You're more than welcome to call them restriction enzymes. Okay. And restriction enzymes um, work by recognizing a specific sequence in DNA and cutting at that sequence. That's what they do. They recognize, that is, they bind to it, they recognize it just like it's a promoter or something. They recognize it, bind to it, and cut at that sequence. That's what a restriction enzyme does. Okay? Why are there restriction enzymes? Well, restriction enzymes are there for bacteria. We get restriction enzymes from bacteria. We don't have them in our cells, but bacteria have them in their cells. Okay? Now, why do bacteria have restriction enzymes? Why do they have things that cut up their DNA? That wouldn't make any sense. Well, they don't have them to cut up their DNA. They have them to cut up the DNA of viruses that infect them. So just like we get infected by viruses, so too do bacteria get infected by viruses. And the viruses that infect them are known as phages, P-H-A-G-E-S, phages. You also hear them called bacteriophages, and that's fine too. Okay. Phages infect bacterial cells. Well, bacteria don't have an immune system. We have an immune system because we're a multicellular organism. We have specialized cells, the white blood cells, that can differentiate and make antibodies against invaders and protect us. Bacteria are single cells. They don't have an immune system. And the closest thing that they have to an immune system is the restriction, are the restriction enzymes. Okay? The closest thing they have to an immune system are those restriction enzymes. Well, how do they work? As I said, they recognize a specific sequence and cut there. How do they avoid cutting their own DNA? Okay? Well, you can see the cutting going on here. Here is a restriction enzyme called ECOR1. It's recognizing the sequence GAATTC within a much bigger fragment. And it says, oh, I can bind here, and I cut. I cut on this strand up here, and I cut on this strand down here. And if we look at those strands, we see across the top, that should be 5 prime, not 3 prime there, it goes G-A-A-T-T-C. On the bottom, it goes G-A-A-T-T-C. You've seen something like that before when we saw inverted repeats. Okay? So by doing this, it's able to cut both strands, and the thing comes apart it leaves what we call overhanging ends. You can see this end is overhanging off of each fragment because of the way in which the restriction enzyme cut the DNA. There are zillions of restriction uh, enzymes, zillions meaning in the hundreds that are known. Okay? There are many popular ones. ECOR1 is this one. Another really popular one is HINDI3. Okay? H and you don't, you don't even know that, but it just Hindi 3 is, is a name of one that you'll hear an awful lot of because it cuts at a different sequence. Um, and so different enzymes cut at different sequences. And in the laboratory, this is really useful for a researcher because I can't work with a chromosome that's seven feet long because just handling it, I'll break it. It's too fragile. But I can work with pieces that I chop up and I won't break them. So Having restriction enzymes to cut very gigantic things into manageable pieces is very, very valuable. It's routinely done in a research lab. So why doesn't it cut up its own DNA? Okay. Well, it doesn't cut up its own DNA because in addition to having a restriction enzyme, bacterial cells also have another enzyme that protects their own DNA. It's called a methylase. Okay. A methylase, all right? A methylase is M E T H Y L A S E. What is a methylase? Well, a methylase recognizes the same sequence 
that the restriction enzyme does. Exactly the same sequence. But the big difference is instead of cutting that sequence, it puts a methyl group on it. You can see the methyl group has been put on that sequence right there and right there. <coughs> the effect of that methyl group is to protect the DNA from being cut by the restriction enzyme. The restriction enzyme cannot cut that DNA when the methyl group is on it. So if I have a protected DNA like this, it won't get cut. If I have an unprotected DNA like this, it will get cut. Well, now let's think about this, all right? The cell methylates its own DNA so that if a virus comes along and injects its DNA into the bacterial cell, it won't have seen the methylase, it won't be methylated, and the restriction enzyme will take that bacterial DNA and chop it into pieces, thereby disabling the virus. That's why I say it's the closest thing that the bacterial cell has to an immune system. The next question is, well, how does the restriction enzyme get there first? What if the methylase gets there first? What if the methylase binds to the viral DNA and protects it? The answer is sometimes that happens. Sometimes the virus is protected, in which case the bacterial cell is hosed. There are no perfect systems. Okay? There are no perfect systems. Our immune system is not perfect, as we know. Otherwise, we would never get sick. Okay. Does that make sense? Questions about that? Okay. Very good question. A very good question. So his question is, are there viruses that have evolved mechanisms to get around this system? And it turns out there are a few. Okay? So there's a virus called bacteriophage T4. And T4 has a modified DNA. It's got a modif modification to its DNA. It puts a hydroxyl group, uh, a methyl hydroxyl group, I think it is actually, onto its DNA. And that keeps the restriction enzyme from cutting it. Yeah. So in biology, there's a constant warfare. Once one side gets an advantage, the other finds a way to get around that advantage, and back and forth, and back and forth. And that's one of the ways in which that's happened. Another way in which that happens is, I'll, I'll get to your question in just a second. Another, another way in which that happens is some viruses are RNA viruses. That is, they inject RNA instead of DNA, and restriction enzymes don't touch RNA. Yes, you had a question back here. Uh, yeah. Can the methyl the Good question. Uh, are the, once the methyls go on, are they ever removed? The answer is no. They will stay on there. So they're not removed. Because removing them would mean that the, the cell DNA would now become susceptible to the restriction enzymes. So they're, uh, they, they stay on there. Well, this, as I said, there are hundreds of enzymes. Here's BAMH1. Here's eco R1, here's HE3, here's Hindi3 I was telling you about earlier, AAGC, TCT, um, and various ones down here. Okay. Okay. You guys are going to memorize those for the exam, right? Nobody even laughs. What is, what is this? You just know I'm bullshitting you, right? <laughs> I tell a joke and I don't get a laugh like that, you know? But I, I, I get a, well, maybe I should get, no, I'm not going to tell a joke. But I, anyway, I, want, I need more, I need, I need laughter. I guess I need to have that laughter. All right. Well, um, we can take restriction enzymes, and the reason we use restriction enzymes is to cut things into smaller pieces, but they also allow us to cut things into pieces and then put the new pieces back together. So you've heard of the term recombinant DNA. And it sounds like a really big, hairy, wild, and crazy thing. And I'm going to show you, if you haven't seen recombinant DNA before, that it's actually very tame and very simple. And here's how it goes. How many people have ever heard of a plasmid? How many people have not heard of a plasmid? Be honest. OK. So a plasmid is a very simple thing. It's a circular DNA that replicates in a bacterial cell. Plasmids are fairly small compared to the bacterial uh, uh, chromosomal DNA. Okay? 
So a plasmid would typically be about three to 4,000 base pairs in size. If we looked at the genome of the bacterium, it would be three to four million base pairs in size. So these plasmids are pretty small. But they will replicate, meaning they will divide in a bacterial cell and make copies of themselves. Okay? Well, they turn out to be really useful for us because when we want to make a recombinant, we want to have something we can put our desired DNA into such that the DNA will replicate. Because if it doesn't replicate, it's not going to do us any good. I could take a fragment of DNA and I could put it into a bacterial cell, but if it doesn't replicate when the bacterial cell divides, I have one bacterium that has one fragment, and then after a few million divisions, I still have one bacterium that has one fragment. I, it's not going to do me any good. So I want to have every bacterium have the thing I put into it. Well, I do this by making a recombinant using a plasmid. Okay, so that's what we're doing here. We're making a plasmid. I'm, we're, not, we're making a recombinant. All right, so we start with a plasmid. We take that plasmid and we cut it with a restriction enzyme. Let's say we cut it with Hindi 3. Okay? Let's say we cut it with Hindi 3. And when we cut it with Hindi 3, we insert, uh, we, we take our, our, our fragment that we want to insert, and we cut it with Hindi 3. So we've got a Hindi 3 on one, we've got a Hindi 3 on this, and it turns out that when things are cut with the same enzyme, they go back together very nicely because those ends are sticky, and we can put them back together, and how do we put them back together? What enzyme would we use to ligate the foreign DNA into the plasmid? A ligase, okay? So we use DNA ligase, and we have now joined together two DNAs that weren't originally together. We have just made a recombinant DNA. Okay? So a recombinant DNA is simply a DNA that has things stuck together that weren't previously stuck together. That's what a recombinant is. Okay. Well, I could take this plasmid, I could put it into a bacterium, and if I did everything right, the bacterium would start replicating. Okay? I'm going to jump down here and show you something. This shows an actual or a schematic diagram of a plasmid that I might use in, a, um, in an experiment. Okay? It's called PET11. And you'll notice that below it, it says it's a protein expression vector. Well, what in the world is a protein expression vector? Well, protein expression means that we're making a protein. So with this plasmid, I would be aiming to make a protein that I wanted the cell to make. Let's imagine, for example, I am a uh, drug manufacturer and I want to uh, make human growth hormone. Human growth hormone is a protein. And if I can get a bacterial cell to make human growth hormone, it's incredibly cheap compared to trying to isolate that from thousands or millions of gallons of human blood. A bacterium, if I do it right, is going to make it. All right? Well, how do I do that? I need a protein expression vector to do it. First of all, what do I need? Well, I need to have my plasmid, so I've got that. And by the way, all these arrows have various functions that we don't really need to worry about for the moment. Okay? I take my human growth hormone gene that I've isolated from the human genome, which I can get very easily. Okay? And I cut, it with, I cut it with a restriction enzyme so that I've got the fragment that I want on, let's say, a Hindi 3 again, just picking an enzyme out. And I cut my vector, hopefully with a Hindi 3 site, right here where this little purple thing is. And I take and I ligate my gene into this plasmid. And voila, I have made something that's going to be very useful for me. Now, in order to understand how it works, I need to tell you a couple other things. But I've just told you how I made it. Now I'll tell you how it works. Okay? First of all, you'll notice I put this into a section that says a promoter. What does a promoter do? It's a signal for what? For starting transcription. Okay. So if I'm going to make a protein, I first of all got to make messenger RNA, right? 
So if I put this in front of a promoter, when I put this in the bacterial cell, this promoter is going to say, hey, stupid, start transcribing this RNA that's right in front of it, which it will do. Okay? So that is really critical. You might think, well, that's all I need to have then, isn't it? No. There's two other things I need to have. One is I obviously have to have an origin of replication, but since I've already told you plasmids have that, as long as I didn't destroy the origin of replication in there somewhere, then I have an origin of replication, meaning it's going to divide in the bacterial cell. So a, an expression vector will have a promoter. It will have an origin of replication. And it's going to have a third thing that's really useful. It's called a selectable marker. A selectable marker. What is a selectable marker? Well, a marker is something that I can easily detect. Something I can easily detect. The most common marker that we use in a plasmid is resistance to an antibiotic. So this plasmid will typically have, let's say, this green arrow right here. It will have a gene that will give resistance to a specific antibiotic. Let's say the antibiotic is tetracycline. Okay? Well, what that means is if I take this vector that's got my DNA stuck into it and I put it into a bacterial cell, I can tell which bacteria get the plasmid by virtue of the fact that they will be resistant to tetracycline. Well, don't all bacteria get it? No, that's the problem. Right? The problem is only about 1 in 100,000 bacteria will actually pick up the DNA that I try to give to them. It's very inefficient. Well, if I take that mix of things that have no plasmid and the things that have the plasmid, those that have no plasmid are going to grow just as happily as those that have the plasmid. I don't want those. They're going to cause me a problem. So I want to kill them. How do I kill them? Tetracycline. So by taking and treating the cells with tetracycline, only those <laughs> that have the plasmid will have resistance to tetracycline. You might think, oh, wow, we're going to spread drug resistance and all this and that. Okay? Well, we want to be careful with this, but there are rules about how you can dispose of these and what kinds of things you can do with them so that they're not contributing to the uh, antibiotic resistance that's out there. Antibiotic resistance much more commonly happens for very different reasons than what I'm describing to you here. Okay? So this is simply used as a laboratory tool to help me identify the bacteria that are my target bacteria that I want to work with because they are resistant to tetracycline. Does that make sense? Well, now I've got bacteria that have my plasmid and all that's going to happen is they're going to start making mRNAs for, for my human growth hormone. The mRNAs will get translated into protein. And these bacteria are going to grow like weeds. They grow faster than weeds, actually. They grow incredibly fast and make a ton of human growth hormone. This is one of the ways in which we readily get many human proteins that are made today by the exact process that I just described to you. As a consequence, getting human growth hormone is a relatively uh, simple thing to do. There may be disadvantages to that as well. But if you are a person who needs human growth hormone, that's a godsend for you. That's a godsend. Okay? We can do similar things with insulin. Okay? Insulin is a little bit more tricky because there's some proteases that are involved. But we can do this with insulin. And that turns out to be really, really useful for diabetics because in the old days, Insulin, getting human insulin was almost impossible because, again, it takes thousands and thousands of gallons of human blood to get enough to treat a single diabetic. It's not very practical. Okay? So what they did was they started taking insulin out of cow blood. There's plenty of cow blood because people eat a lot of hamburgers. Right? And so they would isolate cow insulin, which is very similar to human insulin, but it's not identical, and in the process, when they gave people this cow insulin over a period of time, many of them developed 
an allergic reaction to it, the immune system attacked it, and they're in trouble. With human insulin, that's not a problem. Okay? So recombination and using recombinant DNAs to make things really have changed people's lives. They've changed the cost of doing these things such that proteins that previously we never even conceived we'd be able to give to people, we can now routinely give in a medical treatment. Okay. I want to say something about the word cloning. I haven't started talking about that, but I hear this is a, pro a proper place to do that. We hear the, hear the word cloning used a lot, right? We're going to clone this, we're going to clone that. And the word is uh, sort of bandied about by researchers without really a good consideration in terms of what that means, what they're actually doing, okay? <coughs> I know what I mean when I say I'm going to clone a piece of DNA, but I'll wager you don't know what I mean if I say I'm going to clone a piece of DNA. Because the word clone to you says, here's an organism and its identical twin. Right? Well, that's cloning of an organism. I can clone an organism, right? Dolly the sheep. I can clone a horse. I can clone a dog. Okay? And the techniques are fairly sophisticated, but I can make identical copies of each of these organisms. By the way, did you know that human beings make identical twins, right? You know the only other organism that commonly makes identical twins? Do you know what it is? I bet you'd never guess in a million years. Does anybody know? I'll give you a hint. And this, this organism shares something in common with us in that they also uh, are susceptible to leprosy. Armadillos. Who said that? <laughs> Armadillos and human beings. That's true. Okay? Armadillo. Isn't that weird? Dogs don't have identical twins. You know, cats don't have identical twins. Monkeys don't have identical twins. But humans and armadillos have identical twins. Talk about a weird piece of trivia, right? And armadillos oftentimes have identical, they have identical twos and identical fours. So they will, they're, they're they're different. Okay. All right. So we can clone an organism. We can clone a cell. How many people have taken microbiology? And you take the loop and you streak it across there. What are you trying to do? You're trying to clone a cell because you're trying to get one cell isolated on that plate so that it grows up a whole bunch of other identical copies of itself and you get a little colony on there. That colony is a clone of the original cell that you isolated. So we can clone a cell. Well, how do we clone a DNA? Well, what I just described to you with putting a specific fragment into a specific plasmid, and then that bacterium that grows it all up, those bacteria are all identical. Not only are the cells cloned, but so is the DNA fragment in there. So I just tell you that term just so you're familiar with what people mean when they say they're going to clone something. You have to say, well, what are you talking about? Are we talking about a cell? Are we talking about an organism, are we talking about a fragment of nucleic acid? Okay, here's the bacteria that I talked about before. You spread these things out. Here are three individual cells, and they grow into colonies because you let them go for a long enough period of time, and you can actually see those individual colonies on a petri dish. Okay, let's see. Um, all right. Now, there's one other consideration for plasmids I want to tell you about. And it's kind of cool, all right? So, it uses the beta-galactosidase gene that you've already learned something about. So we talked about the LAC operon, right? So the LAC operon had within it a gene called beta-galactosidase, okay? You can call it LAC-Z if you want to. L-A-C-Z, LAC-Z, all right? What does LAC-Z do? Well, LAC-Z breaks down lactose inside of a bacterial cell so that, the, <coughs> excuse me, so that the bacterium can use the sugars that are in lactose to make energy. That's why the uh, LAC operon is important. Well, that's fine and dandy, but as I like to say, biochemists are lazy people. They like to find easy ways of identifying something, and they use the LAC-Z gene in a very cool way of helping them to tell 
if they've made something that they want. And what does that mean? I gotta, I gotta set you up here. Well, let's, uh, I tell you what, let me tell you what the gene does and then I'll tell you how we use it, all right? So the gene cuts up lactose. Well, that doesn't do anything in the cell except make sugars that the, that the cell can use. So the biochemists sit around and say, well, what if we made it such that when this enzyme works on its substrate, what if we modified the substrate very slightly so the enzyme would still work on it, but it would produce a color when it made the cut? We saw this with chymotrypsin, for example, which made that yellow color when the cut was made. Well, in this case, we take something uh, called X-gal. X, the letter X, dash G-A-L. And what that is is a modified form of lactose. And that X-gal, when the LAC-Z gene sees it, it will cut it and produce a blue color. Okay? So if I give a cell that is making the LAC-Z gene X-gal, the cell will turn blue. It's very simple to do, very easy to do. Okay? Now, I'm trying to make that plasmid I described on the previous slide. I want to put my human growth hormone into that plasmid, and I made it seem very simple. I said I cut it, I ligate it in, I've got what I want. Well, it turns out it's not that simple. It's not that simple because I, most of the time, instead of the plasmid getting the fragment inserted into it, will just come back on itself and have nothing inserted into it. Okay, so let's go back to that slide. Let's think about the slide I showed you before, all right? So the slide was here. Here's the cut. What's to stop this from just ligating right back to itself and not getting one of these? Well, the chances are actually pretty high. Most of the things are gonna come back on themselves and only a few are gonna get this. Well, now I've got numbers really working against me. I get one in 100,000 bacteria are going to take my cells, and maybe one in 1,000 of those are going to have the insert. So just because I've got antibiotic resistance doesn't mean I've got what I want, okay? Because I might have this guy right here, which has antibiotic resistance, but it doesn't have anything in stuck inside of it. So I need to have something to tell me, did you get something stuck inside of here? Everybody understand what I'm trying to do here? Maybe we should all stretch. I think you guys should get, stand up, stand up. One, two, come on. Three, four, yeah. All right, all right. Isn't that better? Come on. Nobody wants to be jumping jacks. There's a couple, there we go. All right. Excellent. Breathe. Remember to breathe. Breathe deeply. Maybe I will tell you a joke today. Okay. So this is this is one of my favorite jokes. This is this is the genie uh, with the three wishes joke. Okay. There's only about a zillion of these around, right? So there's this guy, right, and he's walking down the street. And he sees, in the street, he sees this little bottle, this little vase, and he grabs it, of course, and the genie pops out and says, Oh, Master, you've saved me. I will give you three wishes. Uh, and, of course, whenever somebody speaks in a voice like that, you should always listen, I should, I should tell you. And so he does, okay? And so he says, Okay. She, the genie says, What can I give you? And he says, Well, he says, um, I think I would um, like to be a very rich man. The certificate appears in his hand from the genie. Have you heard this joke? Okay, you're already laughing. This is good. <laughs> the certificate appears in his hand, and it says he has a billion dollars in a Swiss bank account. This is awesome, right? And he says, okay. And the genie says, what would you like next? And he says, um, I want to be a very powerful man. Poof! The certificate appears in his hand, and he's the president of... Apple computer. Wow. Okay. So he says, well, I've got money. I've got power. Genie says, 
and what would you like next, sir? And he says, I would like for every woman to love me. And so poof, he turns into a box of chocolates. <laughs> you thought it was going to be a dirty joke, didn't you? But it wasn't. Okay. All right. Now, poof, I want you to get this. <laughs> this is the aim here. All right. Now, we want to put a fragment in, and we want to be able to tell when we've got the fragment in. Okay? We have two possible things that the cells are going to pick up. They're going to pick up 999 of these, and they're going to pick up one of these. I would sure like to be able to not have to sort through 1,000 different colonies and figure out which one got this if there's a simpler way to do it. Well, it turns out there is a simpler way to do it. What if I make my cut in the middle of the LAC-Z gene? So I've got the LAC-Z gene on here. If I cut in the middle of the LAC-Z gene, what's going to happen if I put something in the middle of it? I destroy the LAC-Z gene. And what happens if I don't put something in the middle of there and it ligates back together? It remakes the LAC-Z gene. And so these colonies up here are all going to be what color? Blue. And what color are these guys going to be? I didn't tell you that. All right? They're going to be white. They're not going to have any color at all. So I can tell not only by virtue of the fact that I get cells that are resistant to tetracycline, but also cells that are white are going to be the ones that I want. And now I've got the thing that I'm after. I've just made a recombinant DNA, and I know that recombinant DNA is the thing that I'm after. Does that make sense? Exercise makes a difference. Okay. Okay. Let's see, I'm skipping over some of this. So here's the blue-white screening. This is a schematic diagram of what it um, looks like, um, although the colors didn't show up here. This is actually showing you sort of very pale color looking right there. But that's what's happening, excuse me, in uh, this. It's called blue-white screening is what the name of the, the technique is. And it uses the LAC-Z gene. That's the beta-galactosidase right there. That's what that is. So you can see I've stuck this fragment in the middle of the LAC-Z gene. There it is. I've got three possibilities. Cells that have no plasmids, cells that have a plasmid but no insert, and cells that have a plasmid with an insert. These guys get no growth because the antibiotic kills them. These guys grow, but they're blue because they haven't put anything in the insert. And these guys are white, in this case slightly yellow, because they've got an insert. And of course, they're antibiotic resistance is resistant as well. Clear as mud? Okay. Okay. Um, that's pretty cool. Now, I'm going to skip over some stuff. Um, I want to say uh, a couple of things that I think will be uh, of interest to you. One is histidine tagging. Okay. We wanted to purify proteins, and when we talked about purifying proteins, we had several techniques that we used based on size, based on affinity chromatography, etc. But that was when I was searching for an unknown protein. What if I have a known protein? Let's say I have human growth hormone, and I got these bacterial cells making tons of human growth hormone. I know what the protein is. I want to have a simple way to fish it out. Well, that's where histidine tagging comes in. What does histidine tagging mean? Histidine tagging means I, when I insert my gene, I insert it into a plasma that has coding for a bunch of histidines to start. Seven or eight or ten histidines, histidine being an amino acid. That's called a histidine tail. And the beauty of a histidine tail is that it has great affinity for nickel. Nickel. The element nickel. Well, I've made my protein. I've got my protein, and it's got a histidine tag on the end of it. The proteins that I don't want, which are all the cellular proteins, are over here. They don't have a histidine tag on them. I take this, bust the cells open, 
I pass it into my nickel column, and what happens? Well, the ones that don't have a histidine tail all come through. Those that have a histidine tail stick, stick on there. I add histidine to it, and my proteins come off. Bang. It's a beautiful way to get this. And yes, I can remove the histidines as well. I don't want those histidines on there if I'm making human growth hormone because that would be altering the protein itself. So I can actually remove these quite readily, and now I have pure, very easily <coughs> isolated human growth hormone. Does that make sense? Question? It's called histidine tagging. This whole process, everything on there is called histidine tagging. Mm -hmm. You guys could explain this to me on an exam? Good. Okay. So histidine tagging is a cool technique. Next I'm going to tell you one technique and then I'm going to finish up with a, with a last one. The next technique is one you probably have heard a lot about and that's the polymerase chain reaction. How many people have heard of PCR? How many people have not heard of PCR? Okay, so there's a few. Let me, let me tell you about PCR. PCR is uh, an acronym for the polymerase chain reaction. That's what it stands for. And it was invented by a man named Kerry Mullis. You don't need to know that. And Kerry Mullis was driving home one night from working in the laboratory. And he thought to himself, wouldn't it be nice to use the techniques of DNA replication to make DNAs that I wanted. To make DNAs that I wanted. Let's say I want to get human growth hormone. I've got a whole bunch of human DNA sitting here. Let's say I even know the sequence of the human growth hormone, but I've got to get that sequence out of this enormous mess of DNA that's here. Okay? How am I going to do that? Well, the way to do it is to have a technique that specifically replicates the human growth hormone and nothing else. That was his idea. I don't want to replicate all this other DNA in there because there's 7 billion base pairs of human DNA and there's probably 10,000 base pairs of that that is human growth hormone, a very tiny percentage. I don't want to amplify, I don't want to make copies of all the other stuff. I only want the human growth hormone. So, his idea was, well, how does DNA polymerase work? It always requires a primer. It always requires a primer. That was step number one. So he says, well, if I know the sequence of the human growth hormone inside of this DNA, I can chemically synthesize a primer that's about 20 bases long that's complementary to the top strand. That is the top strand where the human growth hormone is. And I can synthesize another primer that's complementary at the other end of the gene to 20 base pairs of the human growth hormone at the other end, on the other strand. That's what you see happening here, the targeted sequence. Here's the primer at one end, here's the primer at the other end. Well, the primer tells the DNA polymerase where to start replicating because the polymerase will not work unless it has a primer. And in this case, the primer is DNA, not RNA. And yes, DNA polymerase will use a DNA primer just fine. Well, it replicates. Well, how did I get this from here down to here? Anybody know how I did that? It says, but... Denaturation. Remember the temperature curve, right? I boil it. When I boil it, the strands come apart. And if I'm very careful, I, the primer will find its complementary region and come back on itself, on its complement, just like you see here. That's what's happened there. It's called annealing. So we have denaturation, we have annealing, and we have replication. And that's all there is to it. Because in the next step, we denature again, we anneal again, and we replicate again. And we denature again, and we anneal again, and we replicate again. And every time we do this, in theory, we double the amount of DNA that we started with. After 30 rounds of doing this, theoretically, 
you have made from one copy to start with, you've made over a billion copies that you end up with. This is phenomenal. And moreover, you've made only the DNA that you wanted, not all the other DNA that's present in the human genome. Well, this becomes very easy because you've made this a billion times more abundant than it was before. It's very easy now to isolate this fragment and go put it into a vector and make human growth hormone. Very, very simple to do. This is why I say I could take any of you in here tonight. We could actually go, we could isolate any human gene you wanted, and we'd have it tomorrow. That's remarkable. Okay? That's pretty cool. And that's made possible by the polymerase chain reaction. There's another really cool thing that he invented that, to go with this that was important. Okay? He said, well, look, if I have to boil this every time, that means I'm going to have to add enzyme every time, because what happens to enzymes when you boil them? Right? He said, what if I had an enzyme that didn't denature when I boiled it? Are there such enzymes like that? Well, it turns out there are, because there are bacteria that live in very hot environments. They have to be able to withstand that temperature difference. There's one called Thermus aquaticus, and you don't need to know that, but it makes a heat-stable DNA polymerase called TAC, T-A-Q. And TAC, you can boil it, and it stays active. In fact, it's quite happy because that's the temperature at which it normally exists. It doesn't denature. Pretty cool. So, let's re review what I've just told you. Three steps. Boil, anneal, replicate. And they're done at three different temperatures. Okay? Boil, anneal, replicate. Boil, anneal, replicate. Do that about 30 times. What do I need to do this process? Well, first of all, I need to target DNA. This might be the human genome. This might be a crime scene where I'm trying to amplify and see if this belongs to a suspect. Okay? I need to have a target DNA. I need to have two primers, one at either end of the target gene. I need to have a thermostable DNA polymerase, in this case known as TAC. And last but not least, I need to have four DNTPs because that's what I need to make DNA. I need to have DATP, DTTP, DGTP, and DCTP. With that, I can go my merry way and make as much DNA as I want in a very short period of time. I can do 30 cycles on a, what's, on a machine that does this. I, it's called a thermocycler, but you don't need to know that. But I can do 30 cycles in less than two hours. Bang. Got what I'm after. Now, I was going to tell you one more technique, and I'm not going to do that because I've rambled on, but I will sing you a song because I have a song that's very relevant to this. And it's called the Restriction Enzyme Song. It's to the tune of Chim Chim Cheree. I'm obsessed with A-G-A-T-C-T because it's the binding site of Hindi 3. Cutting up DNA most readily. The ends are not blunt when they're cut up, you see. Five prime overhangs of GATC. Bacteria don't have an immune system, so they must fight off phages or they will not grow. Protection by chopping is their strategy, and one of the cutters we call Hindi 3. On binding to AGATCT, the site recognition sites bent is easily. Phosphodiester attacking, meanwhile, has water behaving as nucleophile. To stave off the phage for a little while. Why don't these enzymes cut cell DNAs? The answer is provided by amethylase. Adding a methyl group on top of what? The sequence these enzymes would otherwise cut. So cells get protected in this simple way from nuclease chewing of their DNA. The phage is not lucky in most every case unless methylases win the enzyme race. If that happens, then the cell gets erased. 
All right.